Hello everyone, I'm Dave Foster. You're listening to Methodist University Football on the Mid-South Sports Network. I have been in the communications business for most of my life. We do uh, sports broadcasting. I live in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Married, have two children, uh, two daughters. I've always been a Duke fan. Saturday evening, I got a phone call uh, from a friend of mine. He simply said, I've got two tickets to the Duke game. Uh, we can't use them. Would you like to have them? Sunday night and everything, I appreciate it, but uh, I'm going to pass this time. My daughter, Kimberly, just happened to be home that weekend. Kimberly and I uh, have always had a close relationship. She was my little athlete. Well, I've redoubled. You need to call him back. Tell him we're going. Sunday, we got the ball game. Everything was fine. We were playing Georgia Tech, and it was basically right around halftime. Well, I was at this basketball game uh, running the medical operations. It was a busy day. We had several sick patients already. We started going to the basketball games to assist with the pre-disaster hospital medicine. About midway through the first half, I started sweating. I've never seen somebody sweat like he was sweating. It was just pouring off of his face. Are you feeling all right? So he ended up leaving. By the time I got down to the lobby, besides sweating, I felt just a little bit lightheaded, just a little bit strange feeling. Luckily, medical personnel were right there. And I'd like to also get a medic truck over here just, just to check you out, cautionary. Brandon left to go get supplies. So I went over to talk to him. Sir, I'm Dr. Wendell. Lynn, what do you got? He's feeling a little anxious, very hot. I was going to take him outside and get him some fresh air. I remember calling mom, saying something's not right, I don't know what's going on, and I panicked, not knowing what to do. Oh, he's cut, guys. Let's get him on the ground. He was in full cardiac arrest at this point. I immediately jumped towards the chest, didn't have a pulse, and initiated CPR. All right, starting CPR. I noticed at that time that Mr. Foster's head was bouncing against the concrete, so I took my shoes off and put them under his head so that his head wouldn't bounce around. We placed the AED very quickly after uh, removing his clothing, uh, and shock was advised. CPR initiated again. After two minutes, defibrillated again. CPR initiated again. I remember very vividly looking up from the head of uh, Mr. Foster and seeing Bob Wiseman running down the hill with all the medical supplies in his arms. During this time, Brandon got the I.O. kit and began to drill right below the, the knee. With the I.O., you drill straight into the bone and you're able to give fluids in through the bone. And at that moment, he kicked. And then I see his eyes open. Uh, and we have a pulse back. Um, and not only do we have a pulse back, but he's talking to us. <clears throat> Where are you? At, at the ball game. Good. I said, we're going to go to the hospital. He said, do you think I have to? I said, absolutely. Durham County EMS showed up, so we loaded him up, and me and uh, Brandon Mitchell and, and Corey took him to Duke Hospital. And that was the longest four minutes of my life. As soon as we pulled up in the trauma bay, I went inside and gave a report to Tammy, our charge nurse, that night. You guys ready? Three. Two, one. Sir, I'm one of the residents in the emergency department. Do you know where you are right now? Got him in the room. He was still talking to us and everything. And then had another VTAC arrest. Is he still in V-fib? He is still in V-fib. Charge to 200 joules, please. Charging at 200 joules. Everybody clear? Yeah. 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 I think it was a social worker that came first and got us. And she brought us to a room. It said the consult room. So I knew then, and then, then Tammy came in, I think a little bit later. I call her my nurse. She got me through the night. You kind of put yourself in their shoes. If this was my dad, I would hope somebody would tell me enough information, make me understand, um, and give me the opportunity to see him if that's what I wanted to do. This is Kim, his daughter. He was blue, and somebody was giving him CPR, they were doing um, compressions. And I remember looking at her saying, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear him die. I don't want to see it. 
And so she left and said, can you just tell him I love him? She just wanted you to know that she loves you. I've always been a daddy's girl. Because I love who he is. He's a great man. And I respect him. And I would want to be like him. And I always wanted to marry somebody like him. I think most daughters think like that of their fathers. It didn't look good because they were 40 minutes in and still didn't have a pulse back. Can we get the, uh, the connector face, please? The decision was made in kind of as a last ditch effort to push a thrombolytic medication called tenecteplase. And tenecteplase works by helping break up clots in the arteries. 50 milligrams of tenecteplase. Mr. Foster started to maintain a perfusing rhythm. He, he got a pulse back. I um, went back that again. He wasn't blue anymore. I told him mom was on the way. And they took him. Okay, RFA access. Go to the bottom of the Once we arrived in the cath lab, everything went about as well or beyond what I would have expected. 5 valve, 10.5 cc's. That's 52.5 milligrams going in. A huge part of it was that this very bold decision to give the full dose clot buster had in fact opened up the artery causing the heart attack. So we could see where we needed to go. We could see the artery behind. We could see everything we needed to see and we could just fix it. Okay, we got Timmy 3 flow. Let's have a 14 thousandths advantage wire. One of the things that we use as a model for our own healthcare practice in the cath lab is the basketball program. The process of rigorous training, of practice, of focus, that all applies to exactly what we do. And fortunately, we had a great team uh, on call that night. I then handed off a lot of these decisions and care to the coronary care unit. When he came in, he came with a ventilator and a balloon pump and several drips. He was not only sedated, he was um, paralyzed. He was touch and go at first. I'm just gonna listen to your heart, sir. Then it was just sort of sit and wait. He would make a move that would scare his wife and I would explain to her that that was okay, that she might see it again. But she literally ran out of the room one night and I gave her time to calm down and then brought her back. He finally opened his eyes and I said, I told you I saw him. His eye twitched. For me, that was the biggest moment of, okay, things are gonna be all right. You can cry with him, you can smile with him, you can laugh with him. And then when you see him like I did today, it makes it all worthwhile. It was a week later as it turned out. Basically, everything is surreal to me. I mean, I, I fell asleep and I woke up. He's been dubbed the Miracle Man. And uh, he really is. I mean, it's, you just don't hear cases like this. You don't hear people collapsing and requiring 40 plus minutes of CPR and then all of a sudden coming back, and not just coming back, but coming back normal. Coming back fully intact. Kim blamed herself because he didn't want to go to the game and she made him go, but actually she probably is the reason he's alive. If Mr. Foster had not collapsed in front of professional rescuers where he got CPR right away and good quality CPR, um, and then got to a great institution where he had very smart physicians uh, and great nurses and techs and support staff, there's no way that he would have otherwise survived. It made me feel like a real nurse. At the time that this happened, I had only been a nurse for about a year and a half. I'm laying there on the, the stone porch of, of Cameron, and obviously as they're doing the chest compressions, um, my head is hitting the, the stones. So Lynn took off her shoes and uh, 
she took off her shoes and put them under under my head. She didn't know me, she didn't have to do that, uh, but that's compassion. They told us once in nursing school, these are healing hands, you know, one day you'll use them for something spectacular. I felt like for the first time that my hands actually made a difference in somebody's life. Without a doubt, these people are heroes. I had a miracle performed on me, but I was not a miracle person. The doctors and nurses perform the miracle. There's no way that you can that you can adequately say thank you for for what they have done. 45 minutes that you guys worked on me, 45 minutes without a heartbeat, why would you do that? To me, that's that was almost overkill. You know, five minutes of CPR, 10 minutes, you know, okay, let's move on to the next one. You know, but that's not what they do. And, uh, and luckily for me, that's not what they do. I'm happy to be here.